Hi Year 13, I hope you are well. It's Miss K here again. Um, today's lesson is on using the chi-square test and interpreting the results of a chi-square test. Um, we're going to go through a word example. Um, it's a long answer exam question that you would typically see in an AQA psychology A level exam. So make sure that you do take notes, pause the slides when you need to, to ensure that your notes on statistical testing are sufficient. In terms of our lesson objectives for today, so we want to be able to recall and compare the statistical tests um, in psychology from memory um, by drawing your flow chart. So you're going to do that shortly. I want you to understand how to read and approach long answer research methods questions. And also, I want you to answer all parts of the Chi-Square research methods exam question that we are going to do together and to understand what is meant by a contingency table and a statement of results. So at this point, I want you to pause the video and draw out the statistical test decision flowchart from memory. Um, try your best to use the different heuristics. So those are shortcuts that we um, have come up with in order to remember how to draw out our decision flowchart. Um, try and do it under five minutes. And I'm expecting you to take a photo of it and send it to me on show my homework. Um, so yeah, pause the video here before you move on. OK, so well done for drawing your statistical test decision tree. Have a look at it and compare it with the one on the screen and make any adjustments that you need to in red pen so you can see perhaps the areas that you need to focus more on in terms of recall. Today we are focused on the chi-square test. So I'm just going to grab a pen and um, circle the chi-square test on our decision tree. And if we think about the requirements that are necessary, um, in order for us to select the chi-square test for any particular piece of research we are interested in, we know that our experimental design has to be an independent group's design. We also know that our data has to be nominal. And nominal is categorical data. Yeah, so those are the, the two main requirements that are necessary for a chi-square test, which we are going to focus on today. Read and research methods exam questions is a top skill. You have to do it with excellence. You have to do it with your full attention. You have to do it with your highlighter as well. And there are a few things that I want you to consider whenever you come across a research methods exam question. The first thing that you need to do is identify the variables that are involved. So identify which is the independent variable and which is the dependent variable. Independent variable being the one that the researcher has manipulated, has changed, and dependent variable is what they are measuring. Establish the research design. So is it an independent groups? Is it repeated measures? Is it a match pairs? Or is it even a correlation? Establish the type of data. So is it ordinal, interval or nominal, which are our main three? And then we know that ratio is another type of data and ratio data is data that has a true zero. So, for example, weight, you can't be minus um, 5 kg. You, you start from zero upwards. But our main three that we focus on for statistical tests is ordinal, interval and nominal. Remember that ordinal data is data that you can put in order. Interval data is data that is the most powerful and it's each data point has a set interval between um, each one. So it's predetermined, it's not manipulated by the researcher. And nominal data is data that is categorical. And also you need to establish the appropriate statistical test. So based on all this information that you have, you should be able to come up with an appropriate statistical test, even when you've read um, a small portion of the research methods question. So here we have our focus exam question for today. And this is the exam question that we are going to be working through and learning how to interpret chi-square results. The question reads, psychological research suggests an association between birth order and certain abilities. For example, firstborn children are often logical in their thinking, whereas later born children tend to be more creative. A psychologist wonders whether this might mean that birth order is associated with different career choices. She decides to investigate and asks 50 artists and 65 lawyers whether they were the firstborn child in the family or not. Before we have a look at the questions to follow, we just want to stay on the stem and we want to identify our independent variable and our dependent variable. In this question, the thing that is being changed is birth order. 
and the thing that is being measured is their career choices. So therefore our dependent variable is career choice and our independent variable is the birth order. They've asked us to write a non-directional hypothesis for this study and you guys are going to do that at home um, or wherever you're watching this video. But we're going to talk through what we mean by a non-directional hypothesis um, and how the, the different elements that we need to include in our hypothesis in order for it to achieve all the two marks. You can see that I've brought up my highlighter, which I expect everyone to do whenever they come across exam questions. So a non-directional hypothesis, it's still a statement that predicts the outcome of the research, but this statement does not predict the direction um, that they expect the results to go. So in this context, you will simply state that there will be a difference um, in the career choices of firstborn children versus non-firstborn children, yeah? And you can see in that high hypothesis statement, I've included the variables, and you might go even further to operationalize the variables um, in your statement as well. And then a, a question that I want you to consider, when we talk about non-directional hypothesis, does it relate to a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? Well, we know that a non-directional hypothesis certainly relates to a two-tailed test. And um, when we come into our, our table of critical values, you will see how important it is to remember whether your hypothesis was non-directional or whether it was directional in terms of picking the right column to look at. Part B says, identify an appropriate sampling method for this study and explain how the psychologist might have obtained such a sample. The word I'm going to highlight here, in fact, two words here, explain how because there'll be some students who will read this question and they'll be like, yeah, I know a sampling method, volunteer sampling, they'll explain what it is, but they're not going to refer back to the study. They're not going to contextualize their answer. So I want you to think about the different types of sampling methods that we use in psychology. So I've mentioned volunteer sampling, there's opportunity sampling, there's random sampling, there's stratified sampling, and there's so many others. Identify which one that you might think is the most appropriate for this study. So arguably, some people may say opportunity sampling. If you position yourself in an art gallery and you've got an art exhibition where lots of artists come, you might want to put a poster up um, and invite them to partake in your study. That's a mixture of opportunity and volunteer sampling because they will still need to respond to your advert. Um, others might say, I'm just going to get a random sample, maybe from a, a doctor's surgery, you get a random sample of participants, ask them what their profession is, but that would not be realistic and you wouldn't collect all the marks for it. Even if you try to justify it, it wouldn't make sense. So I suggest either picking up opportunity sampling or volunteer sampling, um, or perhaps linking the two together. A good way to remember the difference between one-tailed and two-tailed tests is to imagine a cat um, that has one tail and imagine a cat that has two tails. A cat that has one tail, the tail will tell you exactly where the cat is heading. A cat that has two tails, well, it's a bit unclear as to which direction they are going in. And it's the same with a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. A one-tailed test will tell you exactly the direction of the um, results, whereas a two-tailed test tells you that there's a difference or there is an association, but we're not too sure what direction it goes in. It's the same with a non-directional hypothesis versus a directional hypothesis. So hopefully this illustration makes it make sense for you. Contingency tables are a unique feature of the chi-square test if you were to compare it with all the other statistical tests that we use in psychology. Contingency tables are a way of presenting the raw results of a study that uses categorical data. So you can see here the results of the study are here. So the psychologists found the following results. 20 of the 50 artists were firstborn children. 35 of the 65 lawyers were firstborn children. This is our contingency table below. The first thing that you need to do when you are drawing out your contingency table is you need to have headings that indicate your independent variable and your dependent variable. So you can see our artists and lawyers here, they are our dependent variable. I'm gonna see if I can actually draw with this thing. Forgive my handwriting, it's a bit of a struggle. And at the top here, this will be what? Our independent variable. So it's the thing that is changing. And the easiest way to start including your results in a contingency table is you have a look here, it says 20 of the 50 artists were firstborn. We put 20 here in the firstborn column and also in the artist row. Because there were 50 in total, it means that if we do 50 
take away 20, we should get 30. And that gives us the amount of artists that were not first born. We've got here 35 of the 65 lawyers were first born children. So we have a look at our lawyer row here. 35 were first born and there were 65 in total. Therefore, if we do 65 minus 35, we have 30. And that tells us the amount that were not first born. It's important that you include totals as well. And totals help you to verify your, um, your figures because you should always come to the same amount on this side. At this point, we need to quickly recap on the importance of R when it comes to um, statistical significance. So the names of statistical tests that have the letter R in them always require that the calculated value is equal to or greater than the critical value, which is found in the critical um, values table. The names of statistical tests that do not have the letter R in them always require that the calculated value is less than the critical value in order to be significant. And finally, when a test is significant, we say that we accept our hypothesis and we reject the null hypothesis. When a test is statistically insignificant, we say that we accept the null hypothesis and we reject our alternative hypothesis. Remember that the null hypothesis is a hypothesis that states that there is no difference or there is no relationship between the variables that you were interested in studying. So on this slide, we have our results from the chi-square test for this particular study. And it says, she analyzed her data using a statistical test and calculated a value of chi-square equals to 2.27. I'm just gonna highlight that because this is our calculated value. She then looked at the relevant table to see whether this value was statistically significant. An extract from the table is provided below. And the question is to determine whether or not her results are significant. So we've got our calculated value of 2.27. We know that this particular study used a non-directional hypothesis. And for a non-directional hypothesis, we will be looking at the two-tailed test row. We also know that in psychology, our level of probability is always 0.05. This means that we leave a 5% chance that our results are due to coincidence or due to chance, and that we remain 95% confident that whatever results we obtain are due to what we have conducted in our study and nothing else. They've only given us one row in terms of um, degrees of freedom. And the reason they've done that is they've been very, very kind to students in, in putting that in. But just so that you know, degrees of freedom in a chi-square test is the number of columns minus one multiplied by the number of rows minus one. And this instant, in this instance, we only had um, two columns for our independent variable, two columns for our dependent variable. And therefore, if you multiply those, you would get one. Back to our table of critical values. So our degrees of freedom is one. Therefore, our critical value under this column is 3.84. Now, chi-square has the letter R in it. Therefore, in order for a chi-square test to be significant, the calculated value, which is here, needs to be greater than or equal to the critical value. In this instance, our critical value is certainly greater than our calculated value. Therefore, we would say that our results are not significant. Now, remember, I've told you the importance of R. In some exam questions, they will literally give you um, the guidelines as to what you need to do in order to determine significance. But in some questions I've seen, they haven't given it. So it's best that you, you just know it off the top of your head and you are confident in being able to determine whether or not a statistical test has been significant. In this case, it's not. Now, we've done all the hard work, but there's greater work. And this comes in your statement of results. Now, students fumble the bag when they come to this part of the question. It's so, so important that you know what to include in your statement of results. And I've got um, a few bullet points to highlight what it is that you must include. You must refer back to your hypothesis. You must refer back to the type of statistical test that you conducted. You must mention the calculated value. You must mention the critical value and how you determine the critical value. You must state whether or not you accept or you reject your null hypothesis, and you must provide a concluding statement.
And I'm going to show you an example of a statement of results for this particular question that we have been working through today. So we have here our non-directional hypothesis predicted that there will be a difference between the career choice, artists and lawyers, of firstborn children and non-firstborn children. A chi-square test was conducted to see if there is a significant difference between the career choice, artists and lawyers, of firstborn children and non-firstborn children. A calculated value of 2.27 was obtained. A critical value of 3.84 was obtained from the table of significance at the p equals 0.05 comma degrees of freedom equals one for a two-tailed test so you can see that i've literally guided whoever's reading this they know how to find that value themselves because i've told them how i've done it i've told them the the column the row that i was referring to the results were insignificant as the calculated value 2.27 is less than the critical value 3.84 notice how i've plugged in the values there Therefore, we must accept the null hypothesis and reject the alternative hypothesis. There is no significant difference in the career choice of firstborn children and non-firstborn children. This statement of results is, is top, is top notch, is excellent. We've got our, our experimental hypothesis here at this point. We've told them what tests we've conducted. We've given them the calculated value. We've given them the critical value. And we've stated how we've done it. We've provided a statement indicating whether or not we accept the null hypothesis. And we provided a very nice conclusion. So well done. We've reached the end and we have achieved all of our objectives. We've been able to recall our statistical decision flowchart. We've also been able to understand how to read and approach long answer research methods questions on statistical tests. And we've been able to answer all parts of the Chi-Square Research Methods exam question. And in doing so, we've learned about contingency tables and how to produce an excellent statement of results. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to email me or message me on Show My Homework. And make sure that you complete the exam questions, which I'm going to put up on Show My Homework as well. These exam questions are solely focused on um, the Chi-Square test. Well done.